Rushing Wind Biker Church at 129 Knickerbocker Avenue in Bohemia, New York, the crossroad of freedom and faith. God bless you. How are we doing? We have fun tonight? Oh, yeah. Is everybody excited about this time of year? Yeah. I want to welcome uh, people that haven't been here before. Uh, welcome to Rushing Wind Biker Church. We're... Uh, where everything is very strange, <laughs> and uh, you know, I've been doing, I've been, I've been in, in church world for a lot of years, and uh, I've been here now for six and a half years, and I've never seen quite a transition of songs from I See the Lord to Away in a Manger. <coughs> it was like, really? yeah, yeah. Anybody feel that? Uh -huh. You know. I mean, just a powerful place where just God was rocking us. Amen? Amen. You know, for those who haven't been here before, uh, we are going to have rock and roll in heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, in Revelation, uh, John explains the worship scene in, in heaven when we get to the throne room of God and there's guitars. Ten strings, I don't know how it works, but uh, ten string instruments, uh, drums. There's going to be a light show like you've never seen before. And so, uh, you know, us, us out of the 70s, we kind of got it right. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Right? And, uh, and so, uh, I'm encouraged by that uh, because I'm out of the 70s. <laughs> and, um, you know, certain songs here move me um, because it kind of combines the music I was always into when I was a, a teenager and a young adult. And, uh, you know, when, when the group does I See the Lord and Revelation song, and, you know, I was a big Floyd guy. And uh, I'm not saying I'm proud of that. Well. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when, when the guitar um, just hits certain certain things, it just strikes a note in my soul. And, and when I was at the Floyd, it, it hit a dark place in my soul and actually dragged me down into dark places. Because if you know uh, Roger Waters, um, forget who he was because he's a very depressed man. Um, but the music tend to bring you to a, a very desperate place. You know, and, and um, it, it's dark. Amen? I mean, I, I love that music because I was going through hard things. And what it did, it gives you that sense of misery loves company. You know, and then like Elton John wrote this song, Sad Songs Mean So Much. When someone else is suffering so much to write it down and every word makes sense. And so it's comfortable to have those songs around. You know, that's, that's nice in words, but what it means is just dragging you down deeper in depression. And you just get worse and worse. And it sounds good in music, but it really sucks in real life. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You know, and you end up staying there and getting comfortable in a very dark place. And so, um, again, I want to I welcome everybody here. Hopefully, you're, you're going to get a little different experience of, of a God house that maybe you've never experienced before. Because like my brother said, God created us to have fun. Yeah, you know, he created man, put him in a garden named Eden. And Eden means pleasure. And God's all about us having pleasure, and Jesus is all about us having pleasure. And, uh, if you haven't been here, uh, I started a series three weeks ago on Christmas carols. Uh, I think we started with, what was one we started with? Um, it's only three oh, weeks. Oh, 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 joyful and triumphant, mm -hmm. and explaining how we become more faithful, joyful, and triumphant. Well, today, we're going to go in a little different direction, and, uh, and, and tonight is going to be a message that's going to hit hard, you know, and, and, and are, you, are you ready for a message that's going to hit us hard? Sure. Amen. You know, because um, this is a very serious thing, what we're going to be celebrating in five days. You know, it's, it's, it's the radical kind of this incomprehensible thing that the God of creation actually decided to do for our redemption and come down in flesh and blood, be part of his creation, knowing fully in advance how that would play out. And so um, this particular song, uh, Away in a Manger, there's a mystery of who wrote it because nobody really knows who wrote it. The first time it showed up was in a, a Lutheran Sunday school program in 1885. And for a time, they thought Martin Luther wrote this. Uh, but there's never been any credibility to that. So it's still a mystery who wrote Away in a Manger. Let me expand this a little bit so I can read better. 
Um, this song is, is uh, it brings us to almost like a childhood place, a childish place, right? It's kind of soft and cuddly. Wayne and Manger, Baby Jesus. You know, it's kind of a nice, a nice song. And it explains to us, number one, the spirit of humility that God came and allowed himself to come as a child. And to come as a child in a human form, which was his created being in the humility of a manger. And we talked about uh, a week or two ago where that manger scene we see isn't that manger we, we picture. It's actually it was carved into a rock. It was a place where the animals <coughs> would go uh, and get out of the rain. And so whoever's animals, they would throw a horse trough <coughs> in there. And so the, um, the reality is Jesus was born in a horse trough. Not, not the water kind that we baptize people in, in case you're wondering how we do baptisms. But you know those old cowboy movies where they used to fight and somebody ended up in a horse trough? That's how we baptize people in. Uh, without the fight. So Jesus came in all humility and God humbly stepped out of heaven to become one of us because he loved us so much. He wanted to create an opportunity to have fellowship us again. And what I want to do is I want to focus on part of a line that's recurring in this song. And I want to focus on a part of that part of that line. It says, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. We know that verse, right? And it's the little Lord Jesus. And it says, the little Lord Jesus asleep in the hay. And a little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. And so it starts off from the beginning of the song, probably about two thirds in, talking about the little Lord Jesus and about this child that we've always pictured in a manger. And then there's a shift. And I don't know if you ever noticed a shift within this song. There's a shift of who's speaking what in this song. And so we get the little Lord Jesus, and it's a focus on the Jesus in the manger. And then it changes to a third person. And it says, I love thee, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky. Now it's the person actually singing the song, reaching out to the Lord Jesus. You notice the word little disappear. So there's a transition in this song. The reality of that baby Jesus in a manger is the Lord Jesus. And so there's a shift in what this song is actually telling us. And then it says, uh, let's see, be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask you to stay. And so what happens is it's almost a shift that Jesus is in the manger as a baby. And in the middle of the song, we become the child in the manger asking Jesus to take care of us and protect us, help us sleep through the night. And I don't know if everybody had noticed that in the song. And what I was mentioning in the beginning of the series is we sing these songs, and they're great Christmas songs, and it brings us to a place that we're in the holiday and we're enjoying the, the, just the spirit of Christmas and the spirit of knowing what God did to us. And many of these words and these lines just kind of, we just sing them. And every year they come and we sing them. And the old songs seem to have such truth in words that new contemporary Christian and songs of faith sometimes lack. Because, you know, we just heard some incredible praise songs, some extraordinary instrumentation, which brings us into the throne room of God. And what has happened over the years, and I, I can explain this for, in a lot of ways, is the words have kind of lost the power. So back then when music was played on, on very primitive instruments, sometimes a cappella, the words are paramount. And so the words are put together and they were put together in a place to bring you into a place of understanding and a place of emotional attachment to a loving God. Now we can kind of do that with how we're moved by guitars and drums and basses and keyboards. And back then it was all on the words. And we've lost something. You know, I'm, I'm not, not one that really was enamored for most of my life with the old hymns. But as I become closer to Jesus Christ in my faith, and, and just feel the joy in his presence in my life, looking for words to put that into a reality, those old hymns do it much better than a lot of the music today. And, and so, you know, we've been doing this with carols, and, and, and this particular phrase, the Lord Jesus, is the most important part of this season. Because Jesus is referred to as Lord 740 times in the New Testament. It's a lot. So apparently that title uh, is important, that God would have it in his word that many times. The first time that it's mentioned is in the account of Jesus' birth, and 
Luke chapter 2, which we've talked about, and to set the scene, and, and they kind of did that with the, with the shepherds, MC, <laughs> uh, which is pretty cool. Um, the shepherds were in the field, and they had waited for centuries and centuries and centuries in anticipation of the coming Messiah. They were frustrated for years. God had stopped talking to man for 400 years after the book of Malachi was written. Um, God shut down the communications. That you, you just walked so far away from me, I don't even want to deal with you no more. And God stopped talking to the nation of Israel and stopped talking to his people until Jesus was born. And so the shepherds were out in the field and the angels came down and appeared to them. And we've all heard uh, Linus echo these words in uh, Charlie Brown's Christmas. Then an angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born to you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. So right from the first moment, the inception, Jesus was introduced to humankind, to mankind, as the Lord. He's the one. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah. Baby in a manger. But the Lord. And what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What that means in our life. What does the Lordship of Jesus mean in our life? What does it mean in our marriage? What does it mean in our job? What does it mean in our social circle? What does it mean in our finances? What does it mean in the time we have, our talents, how we use them? Is Jesus the Lord? Amen. Now, because if he's the Lord, he should be the Lord of everything. Not of some things, because then he's not really the Lord. You know, when you, uh, when you put up your Christmas tree and you decorate it, what does Jesus as the Lord mean to you as you put on this on a tree. And, and, and too many of us, we, we, we put, we drag the thing out of the attic or we go at Home Depot and buy it. <laughs> and then we put things on and it's just what we do every year. You know, have you ever been like that? Like it's Christmas, we're happy, it's a good time, but we're really de just decorating trees. You know, and, and me and my wife would fight because she liked things a certain way and I like certain things a certain way. And so we've come to a compromise, which most of the things she gets. And so um, she decorated our tree. But I am Tinsel Man. <laughs> oh, Tinsel Man. Hey, no. <laughs> I'm like Tinsel Man. Now, if you, ever want to, if you ever want to stretch your patience and have it tested, allow me to put the tinsel on your tree. Because I can verify that there are exactly 1,000 strands of tinsel in a box of tinsel. Because my goal is one at a time to be able to put the tinsel on the tree. And I drive my family nuts. And I enjoy every moment of it. Yeah. And my grandmother's tree, my grandmother would buy like 30 boxes of tinsel. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> and so you never saw the balls. You didn't need no balls. They were just tinsel. They were silver tree. You know? But when we decorate our tree, we put lights on the tree, right? Yeah. Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. 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 And the tinsel, the way it fragments the light, the way it shines the light, really is the amplification of Jesus being the light of the world. And how that world is, that light is is shown through different things and it sparkles here and it sparkles there. And it's what Jesus brings to this humanity is in every direction he's showing his beauty, which resonates through us if we're following him, <coughs> to show the world just an extraordinary, extraordinary sight of beauty and faith and hope and love. And and that's a Christmas tree. Christmas. Yeah. And so when we do these things, are we doing it with Jesus being our Lord? in mind when we're wrapping Christmas presents, when we're giving gifts, what does it mean that Jesus is your Lord? When you're buying Christmas presents, what does it mean in that act that Jesus is your Lord? Because today we celebrate the fact that the baby Jesus is the Lord that God sent. But is he involved in everything? Probably not, because they're all human. 
You know, we get, get caught in the uh, the hustle and bustle. I really hate that term. It's kind of like, well, it's one of the little phrases you use. Yeah. In like old Christmas shows. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we just dragged it out with cobwebs and uh, use it. And, and so we're going to talk about what does it mean to make Jesus your Lord? What does it mean to make Jesus your Lord? The word Lord in the Greek is the word kurios. This is the word that was penned by Luke when he wrote this, this uh, account of Jesus' birth. The word kurios means supreme in authority. We understand that, right? Lord, Jesus, supreme in authority. We know that it's kind of our perception of who Jesus was. The second part of the word, of the definition, doesn't make us as comfortable, but makes us extraordinarily uncomfortable. It says controller. Your Lord is the controller. How many control freaks in the crowd? <laughs> Hang around me long enough, you'll find out how much of a control freak I am. Um, it has been one of the hardest things in my life to give control. And everyone who's part of this church will say, No, man, no. no. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, um, driving a car. I, I really am totally uncomfortable being in a car with someone else driving. Anybody like that? I want to drive. I, can I don't care if it's your car. I don't care whose car it is. <laughs> if I'm in any other city <laughs> driver's seat, I'm really not enjoying the ride. Yeah, I'll put up with it. I won't say anything. Just know right away that <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not having a lot of fun, a lot of fun with it. You know, the song like Carrie Underwood just came out with uh, about I guess two years ago, three years ago. Jesus hit the wheel. Jesus take the wheel. Jesus take the wheel. Yeah. It's the way it's supposed to be. You know, and then there's that bumper sticker, which is totally anti-Christ, which is like, Jesus is my co-pilot. If Jesus is your co-pilot, you've got a problem. you got a problem. If Jesus is not the pilot, you've got big issues. And you're just ready to crash and burn at any moment. So, to put someone as your Lord means... To give them control of all the aspects of your life. Now, we don't make Jesus Lord. I hope you realize that. Mm -hmm. We don't make Jesus the Lord. He is the Lord. God made him that from day Amen. one. Amen. We have to decide if we're going to submit our will to him. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says every single person in this room, every single person in the world, and every single person that ever lived will say, Jesus is Lord. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. The sad truth is most of that is going to happen for people that are sitting in front of him in judgment. And they're going to go, oh my God. And that's going to have a lot of meanings in that moment. <laughs> right? It's going to be, oh my God. But it's going to be, oh my God. And then from there on in, it's not going to be a fun ride anymore. But everyone that ever lived will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. And so us who um, who have made Jesus our Lord, we're going to look at this tonight and we're going to see what it actually means to surrender our Lordship to the one who's in control anyway. There's two levels of Lordship. There's the partially surrendered life. The partially surrendered life. Uh, I'm afraid that most people living in America, most people going to church every week, are living a partially surrendered life. There's compromises. There's a convenient church. There's the cultural Christians who are just going to do things that are comfortable. Andy Stanley wrote a book called The Christian Atheist. Uh, if you've never read it, it's a very good book. It sounds like a contradiction of terms, doesn't it? What a Christian atheist is someone who says there is God but lives like he doesn't exist. Unfortunately to me, that's most people. And, and probably the majority of people who say they're a Christian. They live exist as if God doesn't exist. Because if you believe in God, and you really believe in your soul that he exists, you would live a lot differently. Knowing that there's a better way, number one, but also, we are accountable for our lives. That one day, every knee will bow. And every tongue confess. And how will we change our lives? And we can't, we can't apologize for how the world perceives Christianity in other people. All we can do is 
do it right and let people see what a bright Christmas tree really looks like. Yeah. Jesus in Luke 6.46 says of himself, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? You don't do what I say. Why are you calling me Lord? But you're not doing what someone who is under my Lordship would actually do. What's the point? What's the point? You know, and I think a lot of people think Lord Jesus Christ is his name. It's not. His name is Christ Jesus, the Messiah, who came as a man and had the name Jesus. Individually, we do or do not make him Lord in our lives. He is the ultimate Lord over all things, but are we making him Lord of our lives? And what I'm going to talk about a little bit is if you have areas of your life that you have stress, if you have anxiety, if you have tension, if you don't have victory, if you have fear, I guarantee you that's one area of your life that you've not made Jesus your Lord. Because when you make him the Lord of an area of your life, you've surrendered everything to him and you trust him with it. You don't worry about it, you don't look back, so that's taken care of the way it is. One of my problems my whole life has been uh, finances, providing my own income, supporting my family. Um, I want to control that. I thought I had control that. I proved over many years, many times, many bankruptcies, that I don't have control that. And it took a long time for God to educate me through hard lessons of losing everything and going through things. That <coughs> It's better for me to surrender that to Jesus and let him control that part of my life. And since that day, almost to the minute, everything has been put into place. Not immediately because there's a faith involved. There's going to be a patience and endurance that's going to say, are you really trusting me? Are you really have faith in me? <coughs> or are you just saying it because you want the end? When you have faith in him for a part of your life, it will come to fruition, guaranteed. I want to read a, uh, a portion of scripture from Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 from the PSV Bible. The PSV version of the Bible. It says, Trust in the Lord with some of your heart. Lean on your own understanding. And in some of your ways, acknowledge Him. And you can make your own path straight. I'll read that again in case you missed it. What does that mean? This is the PSV version of the Bible. Trust in the Lord with some of your heart. Lean on your own understanding. In some of your ways, acknowledge him, and you can make your path straight. <coughs> now, for those not aware, uh, that's not a real version of the Bible. That's the partially surrendered version of the Bible. Right? But that, part, that version of the Bible is what most Christians live by. The partially surrendered Version of the Bible. We laugh, but think about all the people you know that you care about that think they're okay with God. And they're not. It, it, it makes you really think about what's really going on. Jesus is no part time Lord, and He doesn't want part time servants. He doesn't want part time surrender. He doesn't want part time followers. When you follow Him, He wants all of your life. It says, pick up your cross and follow me. And for those not familiar with the terminology in the Bible, what picking your cross up means is life and faith is hard. Embrace it, don't run for it. Run from it. When there's a hard decision, you always make the decision that honors God, and it's a decision that is going to be for the best benefit of God's glory in your life and your future, no matter how hard it is, no matter what the results in your eyes might be. And we pick that, up, pick that cross up and we voluntarily carry it. And when you do that, it's challenging, it's hard, at times it's painful, but what you see on the other side of those decisions are the most extraordinary lives you will ever live. Amen. And you will see incredible things, miraculous things that God will do in your life. Amen. But it's hard. Yeah. But when you make Him your Lord, you see incredible things transpiring in your life and the people around you. Amen. You know, Scripture says if you want to find your life, Lose it. Doesn't make sense in the human realm. If you want to find your life, lose it. If you want true life, lose the life that you're 
we got right now. And I'm going to give you a new one. Hallelujah. And you will see real life. Abundant life. You'll see joy when it doesn't make sense. You'll have happiness and peace when everything around you is chaotic. But you have to lose all your thoughts, all your preconceived ideas, all your tendencies, and, and, and just what you want in your life. <clears throat> because what we want in our life, for the most part, gets us in trouble. Amen. Amen? Amen. And uh, I'm one of the best examples of creating havoc in my own life. Um, if you give it away, you'll get it back. Amen. But much better. Yes. This is what it says in the Bible. We even sing about it. We sing songs like, I surrender all. Mm-hmm. That old song we sing, Church, I don't know if we've done it here. You know, I surrender all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All to Jesus, I surrender. Do we actually do that? Not so much. No. No, we don't do that. We know we should do that, but we don't do that. But we sing about it in the sounds and nights and songs. But when we sing songs like this, if you really allow God to touch your heart, you should sing that song with the conviction as you're singing it, I surrender, I surrender all, and begin to start surrendering, and allow it to, to speak to you, and carry you to heights of faith. We sing, I give myself away, the song we sing here. Do we? Nah, sometimes. sometimes. Some parts, but not everything. And we wonder why we don't have victory and we have anxiety. And and we're going through trials and we can't sleep at night. Because we haven't surrendered everything. If you're having problems sleeping, I guarantee whatever's keeping you from sleeping, you haven't surrendered to Jesus Christ. You haven't surrendered to the Lordship in that area and said, I trust you with that. So I can put my head on the pillow at night because if Jesus has got it, it's in great hands. Amen. Amen? Amen. You know, and this is just a phenomenal life that God has for us. And unfortunately, pick, people pick and choose what areas of their life they will surrender. You know, you can have this and you can have that. And, and, and you can have my marriage because I, I, I don't want to live in an awful marriage. So we'll work that out and I'll surrender that to you because that's, that's... But, you know, what I do with my paycheck at the end of the week, um, I kind of like control of that part of it. You know? Um, or, or, or I'm looking for someone. I'm looking for a relationship. I feel like... And I've been alone a long time, you know, I don't know, nothing's happened, so I think i got to take control of that one back. Because it doesn't look like God's doing stuff. And so, you know, God's got to got other things on his mind. So I'm going to grab that back because I kind of know what I'm looking for. And, and that just wrecks everything. Amen. Yeah. <coughs> Finally, how we raise our children. Amen. Have you surrendered how you raise your children to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? If you want to have a great family, if you want to see your children grow up and be, be great citizens, have health uh, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, surrender your rearing them, raising them, how you treat, how you discipline, and every, everything about them to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and what the Scriptures say, and you will be amazed at the change in your family and your kids. But we know better. Right? Mm-hmm. And we create all kinds of habits. Um, what I'm going to ask us to do uh, over time is be honest with ourselves. Right now, you're all thinking, you know what you, know what you haven't surrendered. Mm-hmm. I know what I haven't surrendered. You know, it's not a secret from us. And, and we all need to be honest with ourselves. Um, in the, in, the, in the quietness of our own relationship with God in our hearts and in our prayer closet, whatever, you, whatever your, your thing is, and be honest with God and say, Lord, I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't surrendered this to you. I haven't surrendered the relationship I have to you. I haven't, I haven't you know, I don't like having cash in my pocket. Yeah. You know? uh, so when I have cash in my pocket, you ever notice when you have cash in your pocket, once you just get better? <laughs> <laughs> you ever notice that? You know, when I was a contractor in the, you know, the days I got paid from, from one of my, my customers, uh, all of a sudden, lunch just got a lot better. You know? And, and, and the money was gone. You know, because I was keeping control of my own money. The second level 
of, of surrender to lordship is the fully surrendered life. It's not doing just what's convenient. It's saying, take it all. Take it all. When I explain to people, when they, they, uh, they give their life to Christ, all Jesus asks is take everything out of your pockets. Every aspect of your life, put on a table. Everything, whether it's your sexuality, whether it's your money, whether it's your relationship, your job, just put it on the table and let Jesus say, okay, you can pick that up and put it back in your pocket. You can pick that up and put it back in your pocket. Because when you surrender everything to him, you'll be amazed at what comes back when you allow him to make the decisions. Amen. All of a sudden, you're getting blessed in areas you never got blessed when you had control. Amen. All of a sudden, there's peace in areas that you never had peace when you are in control. Because you laid it on the table... And he says, I want to give you that back, but I want to give it to you in better shape. And I want to give it to you in a better way. In a way that is going to blow your freaking mind. That's what the Lordship of Jesus Christ is all about. Romans 14, verses 7 and 8, Paul tells us, For not one of us lives for himself. And not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die... We die for the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. It is the only healthy way to go through life. If you don't do that, you're not the Lord's. You're not the Lord's. So Paul is telling the church, the church of believers, this is, this is what it is. If you live, everything about your life is all about the Lord. Let him guard your life. Make the decisions for you, with you, and you're going to have an incredible life. And when you die, I got it on my own. Philippians 1.21. To live is Christ. He is my Lord. To die, I am the jackpot. Amen? Amen? Amen. You know? And, and we're not supposed to you know, try to push that point. Um, because while we're here, I want to be Jesus to people. I want to show people just how extraordinary their life could be as a follower of Jesus Christ. And let them experience the incredibleness of this life we have. Let me take that back. Surrendering. I have the ring on my finger. This is my wedding ring. Some of you have a wedding ring. In the Bible, we're referred to as the Bride of Christ, right? Uh, we sing it in a, at the end of our, our closing song, We Will Ride. And when, when two people get married, um, a wife buys a ring and gives it to her husband. And a husband buys a ring and gives it to his wife. So, as a husband, I'm accepting a gift from my wife that didn't cost me anything. Amen? Amen. It's a gift. But when I receive that ring, it cost me everything. You understand? That's the beauty of a, of a real marriage. Is when you receive the ring from your husband or your wife, you are surrendering your life to that person. Otherwise, you can put the ring on your finger, but you really haven't received it. Because that ring means something. Jesus died that we might have an extraordinary life and then a great life after this. Amen. And all he asks is we receive it. It cost us nothing. Amen. It cost him everything. It cost him dearly. But the question is, have we received it? We use that, you know, have you received Christ as your Savior? You should receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. We use the words... But we don't explain the broadness and the intensity of the commitment. And the commitment is to make him the Lord of every area of your life and surrender to him. And for those who are here for the first time, or those who maybe not be a believer, you do not understand how extraordinary the life you have will be. Because Jesus didn't come to change you into a Jesus freak. He came to make you individually the best you there is. I like to ride motorcycles. God didn't take my motorcycle from me. He made it a lot better to ride. I hang out with better people. And I enjoy his creation because that's what riding is about, right? In the wind, mm -hmm. feeling those things, the, the smell of fresh cut grass, 
the smell of black top after a spring shower. Civilians don't understand that. Uh, only people that ride understand, yeah, black top smells. You know, when you ride a bike <coughs> and then you get there and it's a spring shower, like about 70 degrees, a cool shower, and the rain stops and there's the smell of black top, which it, it speaks to your soul. Yeah. And it's an incredible thing. Yeah. And God put that thing through there. And when you when you make Jesus your Lord, the things that, that speak to our soul, our mind, and even our senses brings us closer to God. We say, oh, he was thinking of me when he did that. Because God created that smell. Mm -hmm. God created that sky. God created the sunrise and the sunset. Yeah. And, and the stars we see when we ride on a, on a warm summer night. And when we, we realize that, life, you know, you think you enjoy riding a motorcycle without God, you have no clue. No freaking clue. I'll tell you right now. No clue. When you understand that everything you're actually feeling, there's someone up there that loved you enough to put that up there, to put that down there, to put this somewhere I could smell the, 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 uh, the orchard I just rode by. God did that. And when you make him your Lord more and more, you experience things. And what everybody else misses. What everybody else takes for granted. But we need to surrender. You know, Jesus offered his blood as the free gift. And cost us a thing. And the only logical response is to surrender our life. It is the only logical response. Anything less than that is illogical. Because he has such extraordinary things in every area of our life when we surrender that to his lordship. If you want a great marriage, surrender your marriage to the, the will of the Lord. Find out what it's like to have a marriage that's based on God. Two people as one. The way marriage was created. If you want to have extraordinary um, purpose in your life, whether it's a career, you have a gift, you have a talent, you have something you like to do to generate income. If you surrender that to Jesus' lordship in that job, in that working place, yes, it might get comfortable because, you know, you're the, you're the, you're the God guy. You know, and, and the God guy usually, you are know, not comfortable for the God guy. we the God one. It's the way it is more and more in the world. You know, but you're going to see extraordinary, extraordinary things. You want, you want to be blessed? God says, I will bless you when you come in, I will bless you when you come out. I'll bless you when you travel. I'll bless you when you come home. I'll bless you when you put your head on a pillow and go to sleep. And I'll bless you when you wake up in the morning. But only when he's our Lord. I really can't stand the casual approach to Christianity. The more I see what God has done in me in peace and comfort and joy and family, this, the more I see, the more I don't understand how people can just say, I'll give you part of it. I won't give you all of it. Because the more you give, the more you get back. Mm -hmm. The more you allow him to run, the better life gets. The more extraordinary. It's just, it, I'm getting goosebumps right now just thinking about it. And I want everybody to, to get to that state of goosebumps. You know, and uh, it's just an incredible life we have. Jesus is not just a baby in a manger. Amen. Jesus is the soon returning king of the universe. Amen. And this is a dead serious topic. Dead serious. Life and death. Eternity. He's the king of kings. And he's coming back. And are we ready? And are we in a place where we're surrendering our life to him so we can let other people see how extraordinary this life is? Are we doing that? Or are we going through the motions? Are we playing church? Are we just coming here? Are we just walking through it and, you know, I pray when I can pray and I pray actually when I just got a lot of issues because I want God to take care of my issues. And we forget to thank him for the things he's already given us. Is he the Lord of every aspect of our life? The real version of Proverbs chapter 3, for those who don't know, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. All of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Make all, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. All of your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. That's the verse we all know. What I want to do is I want to concentrate on one word. Acknowledge. Bad translation. That's the that's scripture we've, we've all known 
us that are kind of versed in the Bible and have, you know, it's a powerful verse. But that word acknowledge is nowhere near what that word was supposed to be. And even the best versions have it. That word knowledge is the Hebrew word yada. It means to know. It means to know. It means to know intimately. It's the same word in Genesis where God said Adam knew his wife and they had a child. That's the intimacy that we should know Jesus as our Lord in every aspect of our life. With an intimacy of, it's not just me and my marriage and my wife and my marriage, Jesus in my marriage, in my marriage. It's a three-part communion and with that, we're going to know him in our marriage. If we take Jesus to work with us, and we have him, and he's intimately involved in our job, you will say things that are incredible. It's an intimacy. It's not acknowledging him in all the ways. It is knowing him, partnering with him, allowing him to invade every aspect of your life. And what does it end with? He will make your paths straight. He will make your paths straight. He'll keep you out of the gullies. He'll keep you from going off into a ditch. He will keep you on the road. And you will move through life with victory and with purpose and with vision with what you've been talking about. In all your ways, allow him intimately involved in those ways. That's what that means. It takes on a whole new realm. It's saying, make God the Lord of your life in every way. To know him is to love him. To know him is to trust him. To know him is to surrender to him in every aspect of our life. In your finances, know him. Invite him to be intimately involved. In your marriage, in your family, in the raising of your children, in your social life. Yes, Jesus wants you to have friends that are going to make your life incredible. Not ones that are going to allow you to go down treacherous roads and make bad decisions. If you allow him to partner in that part of your life and to know him intimately in your social circle, you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed at the attitude, the victory, the positivity, and things that will carry you through things that you're having struggles with right now. The most important command in the Bible is love who? Your brother. No. Love God. Close. The Lord. Love the Lord, your God. It's the most important command in the Bible. Love the Lord, your God. It doesn't say love God. It's really important. But it says love the Lord, your God. And we all love our Lord. Most of us in areas of our life, we're the Lord. When you won't surrender something, you love yourself as Lord of that thing. It might even be other people. It might be your spouse. It could be a friend. It could be a lot of other influences. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul. We are the manager of everything in our life, right? No, yeah. We have our life, we have our money. You know, the check comes in my name, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the house, I kind of like own the house, or at least I, I don't know, I read it, whatever it is. <laughs> you know? um, our children, you know, they're not ours. They were given to us as a gift by God for us to manage to manage, number one, to use them wisely and to have that be productive, whether it's our money or our children. To have your children have a productive and healthy life. We're here to manage resources. We are God's manager. Right? Because he's the Lord. He's the CEO. Amen. He's the guy who signs the checks. Yes. Right? And we have to start looking at that, Amen. that he's the one that signs the checks. Amen. And as I said, when you have areas of your life you struggle with, Search your soul. Be honest with yourself. You have not surrounded, surrendered that to the Lord. Yeah, you're still trying to take control. Um, 
And I want to end in a very serious matter. Uh, this is this has been serious, but this is really the bottom line of of this particular issue. Too many people today are sitting in churches under the illusion they're okay because they go to church on Sunday and then they, they tie it to the church and maybe they got wet maybe they said a prayer and they're under the illusion that they're okay but they're not because unless you've surrendered your will to, to Jesus and made him your Lord you cannot see the kingdom of God here or up there and I think that's pretty much a fact because it isn't Paul that said it it isn't Peter it isn't James uh, it isn't Luke or Matthew Jesus said it the one who died and became our Lord in Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23 he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. Not everyone that says they're a Christian will enter the kingdom of God. Not everyone that went under the waters of baptism will enter the kingdom of God. Not everyone that said a prayer of salvation will enter the kingdom of God. Because the evidence of it is real is, you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I ask you to do. So, am I your Lord? It's a hard message. But our Lord came on the day we celebrate in five days, knowing full well he's going to go to a tragic death. God sent his son to do that. And we celebrate that in five days. And if we haven't made Jesus the Lord of our life, it's useless, it's worthless. It's another kid born under, uh, under horrible conditions. And it's nothing more than that but a little story. And we have to make sure and search ourselves. And this is not a, a message of condemnation. It's a message of encouragement because we all have areas that maybe we need enlightenment in. Yes. You know, everyone here, myself included, have areas that we've struggled with making Jesus the Lord of our life. Mm -hmm. And so this particular Christmas carol, this particular message, it's just a wake-up call, maybe an eye-opening thing to understand how important Jesus wants to love you in every area of your life. And he doesn't want you to struggle. And he doesn't want you to be challenged. He doesn't want you to take on the burdens of this world. He doesn't want you to suffer with anxiety and not be able to put your head on the pillow at night and sleep. If there are people here who have never sacrificed and surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, today is your day of salvation. Amen. And today is the day that the Lord has made for you to be here. Because until you surrender, you're on a slippery slope to hell. And it makes me cry, because I know most of the people I know out there. And that's why we do what we do. And that's why you as my family, I know that the majority of people here, if not everyone here, has surrendered their life to Christ. And it's just a matter of educating the different areas that are oh, yeah, that's why I'm having problems. I haven't surrendered yet. So it's, it's, it's an encouragement that now we can look at areas. Oh, that's why I'm having problems there. And then go through the hard process of surrendering those, those things. And Jesus goes on to say, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Uh, many will say to me on that day, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? Uh, didn't we perform miracles? Didn't we go to church every Sunday? Didn't we tithe 10%? And I made sure it was 10%, it was 11%, just so I wouldn't slide behind 10%. Didn't I, didn't I go out and, and share your gospel with people? And I, you know, I didn't surrender that part of my life. But I'm going to go out and work. You know, we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace. Mm -hmm. you know, none of our, our flesh nor any man could boast. We, we don't want any credit. We don't get any credit because there's no credit for us. It's a free gift. Have we received everything? 
and Jesus will declare to them from his own mouth. Um, I, I don't know what you're talking about. What's your name? It breaks me that most of the people I know are going to stand before Jesus. What's your name again? I don't remember us ever having a relationship. Sorry. I'm just going to have to go. It's a reality. I have a lot of friends who are in mystery. A lot of people I care about. We were at an event last night. The vast majority of my friends in that room. If Jesus came right now, that's what they're looking at. Uh, LJ who? Yeah. It's Jesus our Lord. To you, o Lord. Depart from me. I don't know you. It's the king of eternity. He's coming back, and this is dead serious. In order for us to show Jesus to the world in the most powerful way, we need to make Jesus Christ our Lord in every aspect. The reason I can talk about our finances, and I can be victorious and be at peace and kind of convey that, is because I made the decision to surrender that. You know, when I surrendered um, my, my uh, physical abilities, my physical, <coughs> I don't know what it's my humanity, um, God healed me. You know, when I was in a place where, no matter what happens in this body, Lord, you're the Lord of my body. And... When the doctor tells you your heart's kind of not too good, my Lord, whatever you want, you're the Lord. You made this, your will be done. And then three days later, miraculously, your heart is healed. Perfect heart. Surrender your life and God will give it back to you. Enormously blessed and incredible. Jesus is not a part time Lord. He doesn't want part time followers. This is an extraordinary day we celebrate. Um, this was a hard message. It's hard on me. It's hard on all of us. But if you know me and you've been here, you know I don't shy away from the hard, the hard messages because that's what we can power. That's what people's lives have really changed. You know, you're not going to hear the fluff. You know, there's a lot of good stuff that we share. There's a lot of good things I preach about. But if you don't preach about the hard things, people don't get the reality of what this life is. And, and then you put people on a slippery slope, and I'm able to do that. I'd rather everybody walk out on me uh, hearing the truth than uh, to know that they're going to stand before Jesus one day. I don't remember. We will we? Take away. Take away. Uh, but, but for God and but for Jesus. And uh, I want to close. Uh, is the band playing? Are we riding tonight? Yes. We are riding tonight. We are riding. <laughs> we are riding tonight. What? Every day all day. Um. I don't, I don't get invitations often um, because the job of, of my job in this place is to build up and edify the church. But sometimes people are brought to a place where it's just that time. And so um, right now with every eye closed, you just bow your heads and please close your eyes. <clears throat> If you're here tonight and you've never really 
really even thought about surrendering. Really understood what surrendering was. Maybe you've done the church thing, and, and you kind of that was okay. Maybe you don't even want the church thing anymore. Um, but if you're here tonight and the Holy Spirit is talking to you, and, and you've, you've had this, this burden on you as, as God has shared to me the truth of, of, of what this story is about, and if you, uh, you feel it's your night, I invite you very you know, quietly, if you want to raise your hand and put it back down, um, to make that decision, because it's the most important decision, really, in your life. Um, and if you're not ready, that's, that's cool, because uh, we're on a journey. And uh, if anything else, I, I hope some people have been put on a journey of seeking, because there's a fantastic life, there's a God who loves you, and a Savior who loves you. And if, you know, if you just feel, uh, you know, it's just challenging, you know, being in, in a place with a bunch of people, sometimes it's tough. After the service, we'd be happy to talk with you, explain with you, maybe pray with you. And, uh, and, and usher you into a new life. Um, so I want to close in prayer. And then uh, if you haven't been here before, we have, a, we have our, our closing song that we've had since we've opened the doors of this building. Um, a song called We Will Ride. And who we're going to ride with. And that's our Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for that child and an angel. Lord, we thank you that, that you decided to come down into our realm. Allow yourself to be born through a virgin. To come out of a woman, as all of us have, um, in a cold, dark world, placed in a manger. A very humble, unsterile, just crazy moment in time. And become a child in a manger for us. And Lord, we thank you as we have more and more revelation of that child in the manger is the Lord. Yes, the little Lord Jesus, but the soon reigning, the soon returning King of the universe that came down as a baby. And Lord, as we grow in our faith, help us to surrender each aspect of our life one part at a time. We can't do it in bigger parts that we can surrender little by little until you have everything. And then we can sing songs like, I surrender all and it really means something. And I give myself away that it means something. And that we can stand victorious in every area of our life. That we can have joy when things aren't looking so good. We can have peace when there's turmoil with everything around us. We can know that you'll supply all our needs according to your riches in heaven when the bank account isn't looking good and the job doesn't look too good. And they haven't even lost that job. But you are Lord over that, so I'm going to trust you with it. I'm going to put my head on the pillow tonight and I need rest because God, I need to rest tonight. Well, I pray that for everyone here. And Lord, we want to honor you on this Christmas season. We want to concentrate on Christmas in a way we've never done before. When we decorate our Christmas tree, let it have a little more meaning. When we sing this song, Away in a Manger, let it now have some new depth into our relationship. That we might walk in this world just in a better life, but to help our friends to come into the knowledge and understanding of how great life could be now, and also what's facing us down the road. And I thank you for your son. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. How are we doing out there? Bless it. One of those days. One of those days with the sound system. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. It's that. Yeah. We had this for rehearsal. Got rid of it for service. Yeah. I guess you're gonna have to listen real hard. Uh, I just want to say before we close out, uh, I want to thank everybody who was a visitor for coming. You didn't get to see our normal opening video, uh, but it's important to know that we're not worried about what you believe in now. 
We're not worried about what you used to believe in. We're not worried about uh, where you've been and what you did. We're only concerned about where you're going. Amen. Okay? There's no judgment here. Uh, very hard message. I'll remind everybody, peer mentoring is tomorrow night at 7. If any of that confused you or you were living in the PSV, we'll show you how to get into the KJV or the NIV. If you thought Jesus was your co-pilot, now we've messed that up and that bumper sticker's on there. I'll show you how Jesus is your GPS, your grace positioning system. Amen. Your wife may drive you crazy. Your kids may drive your nets. Your, your mother-in-law may drive you to drink, but Jesus will always drive you towards grace. Amen. Amen. So, uh, like I said, this is our uh, basically our theme song. It's just our allegiance is saying that we're going to ride with Jesus. Amen. 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 So y'all gonna have to say. Y'all gonna have to say. Wow.
and we trust you. And then I thought, I better watch it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, Wednesday, hopefully we'll see everyone at the uh, Christmas Eve Eve uh, dinner and service. Um, the message is going to be another Christmas, Christmas carol. It's going to be O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We're going to talk about God with us. The most important revelation of our life is when we realize that God is with us. Amen? Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for this evening. We thank you for uh, just the visitors that came, Father. We just pray that the, that words were, were planted in their soul and their spirit, Father. Um, Lord, that they uh, have been put on a journey closer to you, Lord. But we ask you to continue to use us, continue to help us surrender more and more of our lives that we might pick up better lives and just have more of your, your glory in our life, more of your blessings, that we can walk in a place that just attracts people, that we're, we're bright like a Christmas tree full of lights and, and lots of tinsel and just glimmering to the world. And we thank you that your son enabled us to do this by dying for us and coming as a, a, a man to save us. We thank you in his name. Amen. 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 Amen.